So it's January the 20th, and I'm sitting in the middle of Paris with Rupert Spara. We're going to talk together for Blueprints for Awakening. <clears throat> Rupert, these questions are designed to unfold and explain your teachings and are asked in the context of the teachings of Ramana Mahashi, which reflects the ancient wisdom. There is the fundamental question, who am I? Who are you? When we ask ourselves the question, what am I, or who am I, or when we just speak the word, or think I, we refer to something. I is the name that we give to that which is most intimately known. It is what we, it's the word we use to refer to that which is most intimate in our experience. We normally think that this I is a body and a mind. So when we say I, we refer to, to this body here, plus all the thoughts, the memories, the hopes, the desires, the fears the, that are considered to reside inside this body. So when we first ask ourselves the question, who am I, the obvious place to look is at this here, at this body or this collection of ideas that I have about myself. For instance, that I am a man, I am of a particular age, of a particular height, of, of, of a particular nationality. So. As we turn our attention towards this I that we know ourselves to be, a strange thing happens because we look at the experience, for instance, of the body and we see straight away that the body is in fact known in the same way that the world is known. The body appears to us as a sensation, in just the same way that this room, the world, appears to us as a perception. For instance, if I were to go now into the experience of the body, it is, it is a, a cluster of sensations. Those sensations are known. They are known by me. And in fact, even ordinary language betrays this understanding. Um, we say, I feel my body, I feel my leg, that we refer to something actually which knows the body, which feels the leg, in the same way that we say, I see the wall or the tree. We refer to something again which knows or experiences the wall or the tree or the world. So it becomes obvious very early on that when we turn our attention towards what we consider ourselves to be, that whatever it is that we refer to as I, is that which knows or experiences the body. For instance, in this moment it is what experiences this current cluster of bodily sensations. Likewise, all the thoughts that we may have about ourselves, for instance, the thought that I am of such, an age, such and such an age, or that I'm a man, or that I'm British, or... These are all ideas that are known. And we know that they are known by me. It is I that knows my thoughts. It is I that knows these bodily sensations in exactly the same way that it is I that knows the perceptions that we call the world. So that's a very a simple but very profound realization to come to because 
previously we thought that I, the body-mind, is the subject of our experience and you and others and the world is the object of experience. But when we look closely at the experience of the body and the mind, we see that the body and the mind are objects of our experience in exactly the same way that the world is. So we now arrive at a, a new formulation of our experience. It's not a new experience, but it's a new formulation of our experience, where we see, no, it is not I, the body-mind, that is the subject of experience and the world including all others that is the object. It is I, whatever I is, that is the subject of experience, and it is the body-mind world that is the object. So, if we keep looking towards this I, we've now seen, and when I say seen, I don't mean understood intellectually, we've seen in an experiential way, by looking directly at our experience of ourself, that what we refer to as I is not a sensation or a thought or an image. So we keep facing this I, which is the most intimate thing we know. It is the best known thing, if we can call it a thing. We turn our attention towards it and a very strange thing happens when, when we do this. We try, we try to look in the direction of this I, this subject of experience. And we don't even know in which direction to look, because any direction is a direction within the mind. So we want to turn our direction towards this I, that we intimately know ourselves to be, but it is always, as it were, behind us. It is always in the, the opposite direction. Wherever we seem to be looking, it is, it is not there, because we, we can only look towards a direction, a known direction. So it is always, as it were, behind us, always in an unknown direction. So what, what can we say about this I, we know for certain that it is present. Whatever this I is, it is present, and whatever it is, is knowing or experiencing. Whatever it is that is hearing these words, that is sensing the current sensation of the, of the so-called body, whatever it is that is perceiving the so-called world, is is uh, knowing, experiencing. So these two elements are inherent in our experience of ourself. It is both present and knowing. So it could be called knowing presence, or it's often referred to as awareness, which simply means the presence of that which is aware. So if we continue to look in this directionless direction, in other words, in the direction of ourself, and ask ourselves, what else can we say about it? What else can we know from experience, from this current experience? What can we be sure of? What is this I? We know that it is knowing and present. We know that it is this knowing present, this knowing presence. What else can we say about it? If we look, for instance, as to where it is located, we find that it has no known location. Because in order to be located somewhere, it must have some objective quality. In the same way that at a relative level, we can say this chair is located in a room. We know that it's there because the chair has qualities that we can observe in this room. This knowing presence has no objective qualities, so there is nothing in our experience to suggest that it is located anywhere. Likewise, if we look 
to see where it ends, where its limits are. Again, we have already ascertained from our experience that it has no objective qualities and a limit would have to be some kind of an object, some kind of um, known object. And this apparent limit would appear to this knowing presence. So in this way, if we explore anything we might say about this I, about ourself, other than that it is simply present and aware, we find that we cannot make any assertion about it from our, from our direct experience. So this completely challenges our, concepted uh, our, our accepted belief, and more important than our belief, our feeling that what I am is an entity that is, is located inside here somewhere, S looking out, seeing, I the seer, or I the hearer located in here, or I the thinker, or I the feeler. It completely destroys the apparent evidence that we have for thinking, and more importantly for feeling that what we are is located and limited. Now, it is one thing to come to the intellectual understanding that our beliefs of being a limited, separate entity have no valid experiential foundation. But it is quite another thing to explore not just the belief but the feeling that what I am is limited and located and separate. In other words, to explore not the, the belief that I am here, located here, but that I am here as a body sitting on a chair inside this room. That's um, a much deeper, it takes the investigation into what, what we are much deeper than simply intellectual understanding. It takes it deeply into the level of the body, into the level of what it is that makes me feel that I am this here and not that there. Many seekers are looking for enlightenment as if it is an experience. What is enlightenment? For example, would it be this moment of realization that you've just been speaking? could say that enlightenment is the experiential understanding that what we are is unlimited, unlocated presence or consciousness. What is it that knows that? Unlimited, unlocated presence is the only thing there to know that. So it is a self-recognition that takes place prior to the mind that what we are is this unlimited awareness, unlocated awareness. But that's not the end of the story. 
because it's one th thing for this recognition, this self-recognition to take place, for presence, as it were, to recognize itself, to, to taste itself. For the, for the dualizing mind, which conceptualizes a separate entity in here and a separate world out there, to collapse, leaving presence, knowing its own being. But it's another thing, there's another, we could call it another stage, and that is when the mind and the body and the world reappear within presence. What is this, what is their relationship to the presence in which they appear? So the, there is a, in a way it could be called a, a, a further stage um, of self-inquiry, it, it could be called, in which, as it were, the world is, is gathered back into presence, having been projected out by the dualizing mind, having been projected outside as other, made out of something other than consciousness. That it is, as it were, gathered back. So there's a further exploration where the mind and the body and the world are explored, re-examined in the light of our understanding of ourself as unlimited presence. And they are seen, and when I say seen, I mean, I mean they are understood experientially to be made out of the substance that knows them. So when we recognize that what we are is unlimited presence, we take our stand, as it were, as the witnessing consciousness behind and prior to all appearances of the mind, the body, and the world. But then when the mind, the body, and the world reappear, we explore them again in the light of this experiential understanding and we discover that they're they are not just witnessed by consciousness, they are made out of consciousness. That consciousness is not just the witness, it is the substance. It is not just transcendent, it is imminent. And that, that further explorations could be called, it's just a way of using words, not everybody uses them in this way, but it could be called self-realization or the self-realization process, which is the reabsorption of the mind, the body, and the world in this knowing presence. Actually, it's not reabsorbed. They've always been there. They've always only been made out of that. But it's in, our, in our actual experience, we understand in an experiential way that they are made out of, they, the mind, the body, and the world, are made out of nothing other than what we intimately know ourselves to be. <clears throat> Are there any qualifications for enlightenment? Is practice that necessary? And if it's necess if you feel it's necessary, what form do you advise? Uh, Can you repeat the second part? If it's necessary? Uh, if, if, if you feel practice is necessary, um, what form do you advise? What, what form would you teach people? From, from the absolute point of view, the only qualification, if we can call it a qualification, is the presence of consciousness. Because enlightenment is, consciousness is recognition of itself. There is nothing else there in that recognition other than presence, all alone with itself. So, truly nothing other than consciousness, than the presence of consciousness, is needed. And as that is always present, the qualification is always available, always present to everyone at every moment. Having said that, if the dualizing mind has appeared within consciousness, and ultimately made out of nothing other than consciousness, 
and has imagined that this knowing presence resides in here somewhere or, or in here, that it is glued, as it were, to one part of the totality of its experience, just this body and nothing else. At that moment, the all-pervading consciousness seems to be shrunk into a body. And at that moment, the world jumps outside. So the separate entity and the separate world are born simultaneously. They are two sides of the same coin. They always come and go together. Once that has taken place, the knowing of our own being is veiled. The knowing of our own being as unlimited, unlocated presence is, is veiled. Now there's another word, a very common word that we use for the knowing of our own being and it is simply called happiness. So when the dualizing mind rises and consciousness seems to be exclusively associated with a body and as a result the separate world seems to, to be born, the happiness that is inherent in the knowing of our own being seems to be veiled. At that moment th this apparent entity it's not that the apparent entity starts searching for this apparently lost happiness in the world. It's that this apparent entity is the search for happiness. It doesn't have a choice. They're synonymous. The sense that I am a separate person and the sense that I am looking for peace, happiness, love, however we conceive it in the world is inevitable. So we set out as this apparent entity into the apparent world of objects, relationships, looking for the happiness that was lost when we seemed to cease to know our own being. And um, most of us try all the conventional means in the world. Sooner or later our search in the world ends. And it dawns on us, who, who is this one that is in search? Maybe I should question this one that I have considered myself to be and that has been out in the world searching for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So it is, it is the interest in finding out who this one is that is the prerequisite. What is the, what is the motive, the fuel behind that? It is the search for happiness. Instead of searching for happiness in the objects of the world, sooner or later they fail us, and the search, as it were, turns around. We face this one, this apparent one, who is in search. For exactly the same reason that we were previously searching in the world, we want happiness because the person is, we, one way of defining the person could be simply as the veiling of happiness. Happiness is inherent, but seemingly veiled in the person. So this desire for happiness, um, or desire for love, is a prerequisite. Um, As we search in the world, we search within the realm of multiplicity and diversity, always looking for new objects, for new people, for new situations, for new events, for new places. So there seems to be a, a, a huge range of options as to what will provide this happiness. As we turn around to face this seeking self, our, our, our search becomes very narrow. There is no longer any multiplicity or diversity there. We are simply looking towards the I, towards the self. So all these disparate energies that were previously focused towards the world 
get focused towards ourself. Um, so, and this, um, as we become more and more focused there, this this search it gains more and more intensity. So it is this intensity of our love for happiness, or the intensity of our love for truth or, or love, which is the really the sole prerequisite. <coughs> and that itself comes from the very happiness that seems to be veiled. So then there isn't really any practice. Yeah, well, the, the, yes, the practice is if we are a person, if we consider ourselves to be a person, the practice is to the practice starts the moment we turn round and we ask ourselves, who is this one that is unhappy? Who is this one around whom my life revolves, but is always, or nearly always, dissatisfied, nearly always seeking fulfillment in the realm of objects? So that the, the, the practice or the investigation is to explore this apparent one, not just the belief in what we consider ourselves to be, but the feeling of what we consider ourselves to be. So the, the investigation is an investigation at the level of the mind and at the level of the body. And it leads, it leads back and back and back, as it were, as we look towards this eye, that the the eye loses all of its accretions. We see, as we said earlier, that it is not a mind, it is not a thought, it is not a sensation, it is not located, it is not limited. So with this investigation, we, we go back and back and back and back until we arrive, until we can't go back any further. And we arrive just at knowing and being, but not knowing and being as two things, knowing being, knowing presence. So the, the, the practice could be called this return to the, to ourself. But then there's an, as I said earlier, there's another, in a way, another stage of the investigation, which is no longer carried out by an apparent person. We have still discovered that what we are we have rather we have discovered by this stage that what we are is presence, knowing presence, and that this knowing presence is not limited or located. But there is then, for most of us, a further stage of exploration, of exploring the substance of the mind, the body, and the world. But this it's not it's not a practice that is undertaken by an entity. It's, it's an exploration, at this stage, mainly of the body, the sense of me in the body, and the sense of not me in the world. But it's not an investigation that is undertaken as a person. It is a, a reabsorption, as it were, of the whole realm of experience, including the world, back into ourselves. And that is a very experiential exploration not just an exploration of ideas about what we consider ourselves or the world to be. It's an exploration about of the actual sensations that comprise the body and the perceptions that comprise the world. And what it is that seems to make a distinction between them. So you haven't, you haven't actually used the word self-inquiry. I haven't used the word self-inquiry, but I've been talking non-stop about it. <laughs> right, but you actually are actually telling us a lot about self-inquiry. It, yes, and it's an inquiry. Into the, I'm not, by the way, I'm not avoiding using that term in any way. I have no problem with it. it it's, it's, but I, I, would be, I would be very specific about the use of that term. I would say that it was an in, that self-inquiry was an investigation at the level of the mind into the belief 
that what we are is personal and limited, and that it is, in some ways more importantly, an exploration at the level of the body, of what it is that makes us feel that we are limited and separate. Because it's not so difficult to come to explore our ideas and to see there is no justification for the belief that consciousness is located and limited. But long after that belief is no longer present, we still feel that we are located as a body sitting on a chair in a room. So both these two aspects are uh, incorporated in what is called self-inquiry. It's not just a mental process. What am I? What am I? What am I? It's not. It's a deep investigation of of what we intimately know ourselves to be. All right. Well, that's that's very nice because I was going on to say that that Ramana had said self-inquiry is the most direct route to realizing the self, and then I was going to ask you about that. But actually, without specifically um, directing your your words to that, you've actually talked a lot about self-inquiry. So, um, yes, it may be slightly differently emphasized, I would say, perhaps what you've spoken. Yes, I, I, I've been speaking almost entirely about this, this exploration yeah. of, of um, the I, which to begin with it seems to be a body or a mind. But that as we look towards it, it loses its acc the accretions that we have, the layers that we have surrounded it with, the beliefs, the belief upon belief upon belief, one sensation supported by another sensation, this dense network of beliefs and sensations that seem to comprise the separate entity. As we look for it, we find no entity there. What is our experience of the body in this moment? we close our eyes, the body is just a cluster of sensations. Do we find whatever it is that is hearing these words inside that cluster of sensations? No, we don't. What, what is our experience of the head? It's like a, a tingling cluster of vibrating sensation. We look there. Do we find something, an entity, hearing, seeing, thinking? No. We don't. So all, all this, as, uh, as we explore our experience in this way, that the eye loses all these accretions, and it stands in the end, at a certain stage, it stands revealed, as it were, naked, without all its clothes on, without all the beliefs and the sensations which we have, with which we have surrounded it. And, and yes, I, I think it's true uh, to say that it's the most direct because any other means that this separate entity might engage in in order to find its true nature involve this apparent entity doing something. At some stage, that doing, as it were, has to turn around and face the one who is doing. And that is, it, that moment of turning round is the moment when self-inquiry begins. It's the return home, the return journey. It's not a progression of this separate I through various practices towards a goal the separate eye itself, the apparently separate eye itself, comes under scrutiny. And as we look at it, or uh, as we look for it, all its accretions dissolve, and that results in this taste of its own self, this knowing of its own self, as it is, not as a mind or a body, as unlimited, unlocated presence. When Ramana was asked, when will the realization of the self be gained? He replied, 
when the world, which is what is seen, has been removed, there will be realization of the self, which is the seer. What is the true understanding of the world and how to remove the world? The world is normally conceived to be separate from, independent of, and at a distance from the seer. And moreover, made out of something other than the seer. So there is something which is considered to be located in here, which, is, which knows, or which is considered to know or see. And then the world is made out of something else, a different substance called matter. We give it a name. It is what consciousness is not. That is basically what we consider, the, what I am not, is, is what we consider the world to be. It is actually a concept. No one has ever experienced such a world. Indeed, no, nobody has ever experienced a world in the way that it is normally conceived of. That is, as an object that is independent of that which knows it. So, I don't remember the quote exactly, but when it is said that, that when the world is, is destroyed or dissolved or got, uh, what's the? Yeah, well, he, the way, it's a little old fashioned quote, but it's what is seen has been removed. Yes, yeah. when the world has been removed, mm -hmm. the, when, the, when the independent, the apparently independent existence of the world has been removed. Right. When its, see, its own seeming reality, which seemed to exist independent of and separate from that which knows it, has been removed. It's otherness. It's not me-ness. When that has been removed, it will experience to be one with that which knows it. In fact, even more intimate than that, because even in the formulation, it is one, the world is one with that which knows it, it's still, there is the admission of two possible things, a knower and a known, albeit very intimately joined together. But it's even closer than that. It is, it is this knowing presence that we intimately know ourselves to be, that takes the shape as it were, of perceiving. The substance of perceiving is made out of knowing or experiencing. It is only the dualizing mind that then rises and says that the knowing part of experience resides here and the existence part resides there in the world. So with this dualizing thought, the seamless totality of experiencing or presence is, is apparently divided into two things. A knower located here and a known located there. That separation never actually happens. It just seems to happen. When we explore deeply, and this is what is meant by self-inquiry, when we deeply explore the nature of our experience, we find that knowing and being never for a single moment separate. It is not even possible for them to separate because there are, there are not two substances there. There's one homogeneous substance that cannot be separated into two things. When that becomes obvious, the, the world is experienced as an expression of ourself, that is, as an expression, as, a, as it were, closer than expression, as a modulation of ourself, as the shape that our very own self takes from time to time, as it were. But as long as the world has some otherness about it, then I am equally going to have some otherness the world is going to reside over there, 
and I am going to reside in here. So the separate I and the separate world, they both arise together in presence and they both subside together in presence. They're two sides of the same thing. <clears throat> it has been suggested that the mind must be destroyed for liberation to occur. Do you have a mind and how to destroy the mind? I don't have a mind, and um, so I can only speak from experience. There is a concept of a mind, and that concept of a mind is like a vast container that is housed inside each head, and inside that container called mind resides all the memories, the hopes, the fears, the desires, the anxieties, the everything, all the images and thoughts are considered to reside inside this container called mind. Has anybody ever seen that mind? Have, have you ever experienced the mind that the thought mind refers to? There is a current thought, certainly, there is a thought which is being expressed now. Or there may be an image appearing. But does it appear in a mind? Does anyone have the experience of the container called mind within which the current thought is taking place? So we were talking about um, this idea that the mind has to be destroyed. So. Yes. In, in order to destroy the mind, we first have to find it. So the mind is, is considered to be like a poisonous snake that is ruining everything and that we want to kill it. So we go looking for this poisonous snake, but nobody has ever seen the poisonous snake. Sooner or later we realize that this idea, this image or this concept of a vast container called mind which resides somewhere in here called the body the, the, inside this sensation nobody has ever seen a, for instance nobody has ever seen a thought inside a body we go now to the sensation that we call my head it's this tingling amorphous mass of sensation and then we take a thought any thought where should we go for dinner tonight? Is it our experience that that thought appears inside this cluster of sensations that we call the head? The cluster of sensations called the head appears. The thought appears. They actually appear in the same place, out of the same stuff. But one doesn't appear inside another. They both appear in and made out of presence, consciousness. So no one has ever experienced a thought or a mind inside the head or a thought inside the mind. The mind is simply a thought. The thought, what should we have for dinner, doesn't appear inside another thought called mind. One thought cannot appear inside another thought in the same way that one thought cannot appear inside a sensation called the head. So it's about seeing clearly, experiential understanding, not intellectual understanding, experiential understanding. That is what is referred to as the destruction of the mind. Seeing clearly that it is absolutely non-existent in the first place. that it has no reality of its own, that, 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 that the mind is, is a concept, but that that concept itself is made only out of the thought that thinks it, made only out of thinking. And thinking itself is made out of the substance of our own being. It is our own being that takes the shape of thinking and appears as this idea called the mind and the world. But just because it appears as that idea doesn't mean that it is so. I 
we could we could go perhaps more specifically to one part of thinking, one part of the so-called mind, which is the dualizing mind, the thought that specifically identifies consciousness with this body and seems to locate consciousness as a result inside this body and as a natural corollary to that belief seems to locate a world outside. So that particular thought is as it were the rogue thought. That thought never truly separates the seamless totality of experience but it seems to. But again even that thought which we could call the dualizing thought or the dualizing mind and I call it that to distinguish it from all other, from many, many other thoughts that we have in which duality is not inherent. Just this particular category of thoughts in which apparent duality is inherent. Even those thoughts don't need to be destroyed because they are fed on the belief that what they refer to is real. They are fed on the belief that it is true that I am located in here and that the world is located separate, distant, out there. Once that is seen to be untrue, then the dualizing mind just slowly dies. It dies of understanding. It is no longer fueled by the belief that what it says is true. It is seen to be so obviously not true. It's just we've explored our experience and the ideas that the dualizing mind presents are just seen not to marry up with, not to corro corroborate our experience. And they simply become redundant. And that doesn't mean that we can't use everyday language where apparent duality is implied in order to negotiate, negotiate everyday life. These old concepts are still used in which time and space and separate entities and objects seem to be given credibility. So we can still use them, but it's, they're no longer beliefs. They're just ideas. They're just concepts that are used when necessary. They're no longer beliefs, and more importantly, because we no longer believe in them, we don't feel that they are true. We just use them. It's a kind of language. So, no, nothing needs to be destroyed. <clears throat> what about the tendencies of the mind? Uh, they can be called vasanas in uh, Hindi. Must these be removed before self-realization can become permanent? And if so, how to remove these tendencies? There's a very nice image that I would like to use in this respect, and that is of a very deep well in which many creepy crawlies live. And normally only the creepy crawlies that live at the surface of the well are alive and active. The ones that live in the depths of the well are in hibernation, fast asleep most of the time. But every day, for a short period of time, the sun is directly above the well and its light shines straight down to the bottom. At that moment, all the deep, dark, creepy crawlies wake up and they start coming towards the surface. And the sun continues to move over and they quietly go back to sleep again. So these tendencies, or vasanas of the, of the mind, are like these creepy crawlies that live in the well. They, they live at all different levels. There are some on the surface with which we are very familiar. 
the places where our buttons get pressed. They're pretty obvious and they're unique in each of our cases and they, they die away very quickly, fall away very quickly when it becomes obvious that what we, what we are is not limited or located. These immediate expressions of, of separation, all the defense mechanisms, the strategies, the, they, they very quickly drop away. But the deeper ones are less obvious. They take time. This is the, as it were, the taproot of separation, the deepest, darkest places where the sense of separation resides. And it resides right deep down in the body, not in our thoughts, not in our feelings. So what is it that allows these deep, dark, difficult feelings to rise to the surface? It is the presence of the sun above the well. So what is the presence of the sun? The presence of the sun is the presence of consciousness. So it is turning and facing this presence all the time. When I say facing this presence, that's a metaphor. What I mean is taking one's stand knowingly as this presence, as this open, infinite, all-pervasive, loving presence, and allowing, or we could say offering, everything in the body-mind to this presence. So it's like we allow the sun of our presence to, to pervade the body. We open ourselves completely to it, allow everything to come up. There is no, we have absolutely no agenda with it. There is no need anymore to keep all these deep, dark, difficult feelings suppressed because the one who is afraid of them is no longer present. The one, or rather, the one who is afraid of them is, has already been seen to be non-existent. So there is no longer any agenda with the character. So the character, to, sometimes it may begin to display itself a little bit more colorfully. And it's very common, some people say, I thought I was going to get more peaceful as a result of doing this. Actually, I feel more disturbed now, more agitated than before. And thats it's not really a sign of more agitation. Truly, it's a sign of more peace. But it's because we are taking our stand more and more as this welcoming presence that all these feelings that, see, that were previously suppressed through fear, they seem to be too dark and too difficult to deal with. Now... It's, they're just like, just like the weather. We, 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 we allow them to come up. So it's this um, taking our stand as this openness, as this completely loving, unjudging, indifferent, disinterested presence that allows everything to appear. Nothing can <clears throat> appear without presence first saying yes to it, as it were. Nothing can appear outside consciousness. So we know that what we are, presence cannot be touched by any appearance of the mind, the body, or the world, in just the same way that the space in this room, however agitated the activity in this room might become, whatever anybody said or did, would leave the space completely untouched, and yet the space would have to be there to allow it in the first place. Presence is the same. Presence is this loving, open space in which all possible shapes of the mind and the body can appear, but we know that what we are ultimately is untouched by it, and therefore we don't need to have an agenda. And it's that lack of agenda, that lack of resistance to these tendencies, these characteristics, that allows them to come out of hiding, to show their face. They're not going to be crushed anymore. They're not going to be judged. They're not going to be disapproved of. They're just a little ripple of energy 
passing through presence. And there's a finite number of them, if we can call, say there's a number. There's, they're, they're finite. Why? Because they're objects. So they, they come up, and that's different in every case. So that's a, a process that takes time. And it's as these tendencies come up and are offered, exposed to the light, and are, as it were, dissolved by the light of awareness through no effort, through no attempt to get rid of them, just to allow them, just to love them. As, as that happens, we, we become more and more established in, in, the, in the peace of, of presence. It becomes clearer and clearer at an experiential level that what we are is untouchable and yet gives itself utterly and intimately to every appearance. So this process of allowing everything, loving everything, welcoming everything is the process of, as it were, becoming stable in this experiential understanding. And it's a process that happens naturally, but at the same time we can also cooperate with it. Life presents situations where all these deep, dark, difficult feelings are provoked. But there are also um, ways in which we can cooperate with the process. For instance, we normally feel very strongly that what we are is located in here, behind the eyes thinking or in here in the chest feeling so we can we can imagine that what we are is not located in here we can we can imagine that we are located in the space behind our body a very strange thing happens when we when we do that because that if if it's true that we are unlocated, then we should feel ourselves, we should feel ourselves in that way, to be unlocated. Not just to think that we are unlimited consciousness, but to feel that we are unlocated. So if we try to do that, a very interesting thing happens. We, we, we feel a resistance to begin with, because we're so accustomed to identifying ourselves with a body. So if we make the effort, for instance, to to reside in a space, for instance, behind us or, or, or above us. It's like a spring. There is a habit to begin with that pulls us back to feeling located in the body. So the attempt to do this reveals old habits of feeling on behalf of a separate entity, of feeling limited and located. And as these habits in other words, th th this is a, a way of, of, of these creepy crawlies at the bottom of the well waking up, thinking, no, no, I, I'm, I'm dense, I'm located in the body, I'm made out of matter. It's, so these, these, this is one very loving, cooperative way of, of, as it were, inviting these tendencies to appear. To say, please, come, come, I... I I want to discover what you are made of. Come and come up. Come and show yourself. So it's again, it's not, I repeat, it's not in any way an attempt to do anything to them, but just to say it's just a, a, a way in which these old habits of feeling on behalf of a separate entity can be revealed.
life will reveal them anyway. But these are, are just uh, beautiful ways in which these frightened little creatures at the bottom of that well can be encouraged to, to show up and to be loved for what they are and to be let go of. Mm. Yeah, that's nice. What about destiny? Do you expect things to simply happen? Or are you expressing your free will and choosing? It depends what you mean by you. Or it depends what you mean by your free will. Who, whose free will are we referring to? If we understand that the separate entity that we believe and feel ourselves to be is simply made out of the thought that thinks it and the feeling that feels it, then it doesn't make sense to think that this thought creates something or wills something or chooses. Thought is just, is just a th that, 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 that entity is, is just made out of that thought. It, it, it's non-existent as an entity. So it doesn't make sense to, to think that this non-existent entity has free will or indeed any kind of will or that chooses anything. It's like saying, does the pink elephant sitting under your chair have free will? choose, decide, think, or feel. Both the answer yes and the answer no presupposes the existence of the pink elephant. But the pink elephant doesn't exist. The separate entity, we have already, we have already seen that it's non-existent. So it's not, there's no question of a, of a separate entity choosing anything or, or willing anything. Um, Our experience is that thoughts appear not just in us, but they are made out of us. So the substance of a thought or the substance of thinking is made out of consciousness. It is Consciousness has the freedom to take any shape, all possible shapes. William Blake, the, the, the poet, said, all things possible to be believed are an image of truth. All things possible to be believed. Or he could have said, imagined, sensed, or perceived, are an image of truth. And in that sense, everything that takes place is an expression of this unlimited possibility of consciousness to take all possible shapes. So yes, at that level there is complete freedom. In fact, when we talk about freedom, we refer to this quality that consciousness has to take all possible, to take the shape of all possible appearances. That is why it is called freedom. So it is freedom for consciousness. It is not freedom f for a non-existent entity. So freedom is, is one of the words that is used sometimes to qualify consciousness, because it is inherent in its nature. It is, it, it is by definition, it is freedom itself, because it can take the shape of all possible appearances. It has many other names, such as peace, because at the same time as, at the, at the same time as it takes the shape of all possible appearances, it is not touched by any of those appearances, in the same way that a television screen can take the shape of any image, however wonderful or awful, but the screen itself is never touched by the image. Consciousness is never touched by any of the appearances, although it gives birth to every appearance. And for that reason, it is known as peace. It is, it is often known, called love. And it is the same reason. It is because everything that appears, it is because consciousness gives birth to everything that appears. It, 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 everything that appears comes out of presence. 
It's not that it comes out of it and, and remains somewhere else. It is always only presence. It's the relationship of any object, any apparent object to consciousness, is so utterly intimately one that the very substance of every object is only consciousness. Consciousness gives its own substance, like a mother giving birth to a child, to every appearance. And for that reason it is known as love. It is this absolute utter intimacy with all things. So, I'm developing your question a, a bit, but, but yes, so f freedom, peace, love uh, are names that are given to qualities that are, that are inherent in consciousness. And just in the same way that it is never a person that has freedom, in, this, in just the same way it is never a person that is peaceful and it is never a person that loves or is loved. It is always, love is always peace, freedom is always, as it were, presence tasting its own being, knowing its own self as it is, not through the veil of the apparently dualizing mind. You, you're using this word love <coughs> yes. right now. I, mean, I think this is a word that um, causes a lot of trouble for people, like this thing about the mind, the mind should go. Could you say something about mind in the con... in the... About love. Yeah, about <laughs> love. In the, in the situation of... Um, as, you, as you would feel, actually. I, I don't want to pin <coughs> it down to a particular... If you could just unfold a bit more about this word love. If, if we were to stop anyone on the street that had never heard about non-duality or Ramana Maharshi or, and, and ask them, what, what do you mean by love? Most people would describe it in one way or another as a dissolution of whatever it is that keeps us apart or separate from the so-called other. So just in common parlance when we talk about falling in love we, f we refer to this experience where we, we kind of lose our boundaries, we lose ourselves in this whatever it is that we refer to as love. So even, even in, in the normal understanding of the word love, there is this deep intuition that love is a dissolution of the boundaries with which we normally surround ourselves, with which we normally imprison ourselves. So love is one word that is given to this non-objective experience of consciousness tasting its own being, knowing its own self. When it ceases to create a dualizing thought with which, with which it seems to become located as an entity here, in which all others and objects seem to be located out there. It is the collapse of this dualizing thought, which seems to separate the totality, the seamless totality of experience into two things, I and the world, me and you. It is the collapse of this dualizing thought, which is itself only made out of consciousness. So there is never any true separation. But it is with the collapse of this separating line that is made only out of thinking and feeling that the seamless totality of experience, as it were, recognizes itself. And it is that self-recognition that is called love. So, of course, when the mind reappears out of this non-objective experience. The mind, as usual, or as, as nearly always, misinterprets the experience. The dualizing mind reappears. It immediately creates 
a person in here and another person out there. And it says, I, in here, love you, over there. That is just a complete misinterpretation of the experience of love by the mind, which was not there during the experience. It knows nothing of the experience of love because it is love is defined by the absence of mind, the absence of those qualities that seemed to separate us, that we, that, that, that we imagined separated us, that, ima- that we imagined separate the, the totality of experience. When that collapses, experience goes back. It doesn't go back because it's always only ever been this seamless totality. But it knows itself as that. It recognizes itself as that. And that recognition is what we call love. Now when we meet, when we as an apparent other meet a friend and something about this meeting seems to precipitate this recognition of our own being. We call it love. When exactly the same thing happens in relation, say, to an object or a work of art, the apparent seer in here and the apparent object seen out there collapse in this experience. And then we refer to exactly the same non-objective experience as beauty. So normally when we see it in relation, when it seems to be triggered by a meeting with a person, we call it love. When it seems to be triggered by an object, we call it beauty. When it seems to be triggered by the acquisition of an object, we call it happiness. But these are all different words that refer to exactly the same non-experience, non-objective experience. The, 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 the tasting of our own being, the knowing of our own being. That was an attempt to say something about love which I should really not do. No, I think you should, you should, I think you should do it because <laughs> it's something that causes people a lot of trouble and I think what you said is very good. And I actually would like to encourage you now to talk a bit more about beauty because um, that's also something which people maybe don't always bring together with this yes. subject of truth. Yes, that, that's very true. Um, the two paths of, of um, knowledge and love are well documented in the spiritual traditions. Mm. The path of jnana and the path of bhakti uh, are well known. But there is a third path, the path of beauty, which is very rarely spoken of. So the path of, of knowledge, <laughs> which culminates in understanding, and by understanding I don't mean understanding in the mind. By understanding, I mean the dissolution of the mind. So on the way of knowledge, the mind investigates and it dissolves into its source. That is called understanding. In in the path of bhakti, we go more with our feelings than with our mind. We don't find the beloved, we dissolve in the beloved. And that is called love. But there is a third mode of experiencing. We don't just think and sense. We also perceive. So there is a third path that corresponds to this third mode of experiencing, which is (coughs) arrived at through the process of perceiving, seeing, in the case of a painting or a sculpture, tasting in the in the case of food, um, hearing in the, taste, in the case of, of music. So these are, so whichever path, as it were, we set out on, whether it is through thinking, through feeling, or perceiving, 
at the end of that apparent process, the thinking, feeling or perceiving dissolves into that which is its source, its substance. And that experience is called understanding or love, or in the case of perceiving, beauty. So beauty is, is again, another name for the taste of our own being, the knowing of our own being. And it's the particular name we give it when it has been, as it were, accessed through perceiving. So in the same way that we may listen to a, a dialogue or a conversation that expounds the teaching, and this will dissolve the mind in understanding, on the way of beauty, it's just done through the senses, just through perceiving. It's not, it's not a, a mental process. Um, the best example I can think of in this respect is, is the painter Paul Cezanne, who was a pure non-dualist. And he said, and, and I'll quote it because it's, it's a most beautiful, succinct, clear expression of, of um, the way of art, the way of beauty. He said, everything vanishes, falls apart, doesn't it? Nature is always the same and yet nothing in her that appears to us lasts. Our art must render the thrill of her permanence along with her elements, that is, the appearance of all her changes. It must give us the taste of her eternity. So he, he's saying everything that he's talking to the world, he's standing in front of <coughs> Mont Saint-Victoire, the most solid, permanent, enduring, structure in nature and he's saying everything vanishes the world vanishes the world falls apart what did he mean he means that we have a belief that the outside world is solid tangible real independent of consciousness but actually when we go to our experience which is what he was and this is what he was trying to portray in his painting when we go to the experience we find that the world is only made out of perceptions that's our only knowledge of the world, is perception. We have no other knowledge. We don't even know if there is a world outside our perception. So he was saying, everything vanishes. The world, every time a perception vanishes, the world vanishes. Every time a perception vanishes, the apparent solidity of the world falls apart. Everything vanishes, falls apart, doesn't it? And then he says, nature is always the same, and yet nothing in her that appears to us lasts. Well, these seem to be contradictory. In one moment he says, nature is always the same. There is something which lasts all the way through, always the same. And then he says, but nothing in her that appears to us lasts. So what can this always the same be made out of? He's already said it's not made out of perceptions. It's not made out of intermittent perceptions, because by definition, they don't last. And he says, our art must give us the thrill of her permanence. Our art, what we make as artists, must give us the joy. It must give us the thrill of her permanence, the, the, the thrill, the joy of that, whatever that is, that is ever-present, that runs throughout our perception of the world. And then he says, along with her elements, the appearance of all her changes. In other words, it must take the appearance of all her ch changes, in his case, colors, in a musician's case, sounds. So it must take all these appearances and it must arrange them in such a way that it gives us a thrill of her permanence, the thrill of that which lies behind her appearances. It must arrange the appearances, the colors, in such a way that it indicates the permanent, what he called 
that which is always the same, the permanent background. And then he finishes, it must give us a taste of her eternity. Not the taste of that which is always present in time, but the taste of that which is ever present, timelessly ever present. So here he, he's, he's observing the world. He's seeing that the world as such doesn't exist in the way we conceive it to be. It only consists of perceptions. Those perceptions are falling apart, but there is a reality that pervades them. They appear against a background. Of course, he's referring to consciousness, to, or to whatever we call it. That's what we call it, but he didn't use that word. And then he's saying that a, a work of art is so arranged, all these appearances are so arranged by the artist as to somehow give a taste not to give the concept of non-duality, not to give the concept of eternity, but to give a taste. Our art must give us, it, our art must give the thrill of her permanence. To, to, it's not just, a, it's not just a, a neutral background. He indicates that this background, that which is ever present in the experience of nature or the experience of the world, is not just this bland background. He calls it thrilling. William Blake described exactly the same thing. Every bird that cuts the airy way, every bird that flies through the sky is an immense world of delight enclosed by the five senses. An immense world of delight, what Cezanne calls a thrill. It's delightful. It's made out of love. It's not just a neutral background. It's what, in the Indian tradition, they mean by Nama Rupa Satchitananda. When that which when name and form are removed from the background upon which they appear, the apparent knowing of, 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 of reality and the apparent existence, these two apparent things, knowing in here and existence out there, they collapse, or the separate, or rather the separation between them collapses, and Ananda is the result. What Cezanne referred to as the thrill, what Blake called the delight, what we could just call love or joy. And this third path is, is made available through the senses, through sensing, through hearing, through seeing, through touching. So that's, that's where, uh, through, through, through tasting, a, a, a really exquisite cook is doing the same thing, just dissolving us in, in being. Gives us the taste, not, not just the idea, how intimate is the taste, it goes straight, this way of beauty, it goes straight in. It doesn't go through the mind, like these words have to go through the mind before they before we dissolve in understanding. It goes straight, straight to the heart, straight, unmediated by thinking. And that's the power of art, of a true work of art. That's because a true work of art, like Cezanne's paintings, come from this experience. So I wanted to ask you, <clears throat> if you look back at some of the great artists, whether it's musicians like Beethoven or painters like Michelangelo, do you have any sense if, in fact, these people were also awakened, even though apparently it's, it wouldn't be talked about? They were talked about always as great artists, creative geniusi geniuses. It, it, it's never a person that is awakened. There's never, a, there's never anybody there who is awakened. So. In their case, the, the, their body minds, or the body mind of an artist or a poet, is, is, is a body mind that is, that, that, it, that is refined and sensitive, mm -hmm. and that has, it, 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 in the case of an artist, a, a, um, a skill that has learnt the A to Z of his or her art form, so has the means available in the body to put into, to express something in form. But it's in the moment of creation, it is the absence 
of this sense of separation that allows the, the experience, the momentary experience of beauty, the tasting of our own being, to take the shape through the particular qualities of the body-mind that, in the, that in, in, in the case of an artist have become very refined and have learnt a skill, that have a skill, that have ability in, in music or painting. For example, Michelangelo produced the Pieta in the Vatican, I think, when he was 20 years old, something yes. like that. Whether or not, when <laughs> his mind returned, after the experience, after the, the moment of painting, whether, when he goes, went home, the I thought then arose again and said, I, this body-mind, was the creator and the doer of that painting. The answer is, I have no idea. I suspect in many cases the I thought returned. But the I thought is just a, it's like a filler thought that appears after the event and fills the gap between perceptions. In the natural state, when thinking comes to an end, when feeling comes to an end, when perceiving comes to an end, we just remain as we are. Open, empty, available, ready to take the shape of the next appearance. But this, this, in, in, in this timeless <laughs> gap, in order to, as it were, avoid the emptiness, the apparent emptiness, of this gap, we recreate the I thought, which says, I thought it, I created it, I did it, I chose it, I saw it, I loved it. <coughs> and in the work, case for work of art, I did it, I thought. So maybe that did happen, maybe it didn't, I've no idea. But in the moment of creating, there was this transparency, the reality of experience and this is just a metaphor now, the reality of experience here recognized itself out there in the, in the Mont Saint-Victoire, in Cézanne's case. There was this recognition that was then translated into the medium of the mind, colors, form. But it was this self-recognition that was being modulated by the mind, given form. But in that moment, there was just pure seeing pure experiencing, given the shape of perceiving. Maybe thinking came back later and claimed it. I don't know. But it doesn't matter because what was left from this, in this case, this moment of painting, or what, what is left to us of Bach's music, still shines with that same power it still shines with the place, the experience from which it came. And therefore it still has the power within it to, to transmit, to give us a taste, to deliver that experience. When I say deliver that experience, that, that's a, a metaphor. I mean to reawaken, to inspire this recognition. Some, some artists, not only did they have, were they able to express this, not only did they experience it and had the ability, ability to express it, they also knew what was going on. In a sense, the I thought didn't come back. Someone like Rumi, he was not only an artist, he was also a mystic, or, or, or not just a poet, but also a mystic. Some it seems weren't. But I'm speculating now because at that level I, I, I don't know about what thoughts appeared to Michelangelo. <laughs> okay. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because mm. what they truly were is left for subsequent generations. And, and the reason why now when we hear certain pieces of music or see certain paintings and, and it just dissolves us, it, it just melts us, it, it is because they, they come pregnant with the experience from which they, or they, 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 um, they are permeated, they are pregnant with them, with their origin.
Okay, it's slightly now on a different tack. It, it appears essential to meet a master and surrender to that master. Who is the master? What is the master's role? And how to recognize a true master? Once we have believed and, more importantly, come to feel that we are a separate entity, that belief and that feeling veils the knowing of our own being. And as a result, happiness or love seems to be lost. And everything and everyone else is projected outside. Now, what is it that initiates the return to ourself, so to speak. Because we have already seemed to contract into this separate entity, this awakening or reawakening or recognition comes in most cases in the form of an appearance that seems to be outside and other. in just the same way that when we fall in love, when we are young, we think we fall in love with a person. Later on, it becomes more obvious that actually in the experience of love, I and the other dissolved. There was no I there and there was no person there. But in just the same way, when we, when we have been out searching in the world for, for long enough, and that takes a different period of time for each of us, it is as if, as if this presence takes the shape of a very special appearance in the world, just like it took a, a shape of a person that we fell, fell in love with. It takes the shape of, of what we call the teacher or a friend or, or the master. And just like our lover seems to be someone outside, so the teacher seems at first to be outside, seems to be a person, seems to be an object, seems to be other. And it is this apparent other that facilitates this turn towards ourself. That's how it seems to be. But as time goes on, if we stay, if we develop a, a friendship, with this apparent other, all the qualities with which we distinguish ourselves and separate ourselves, both from the teacher, but in fact from everyone and everything, they slowly start falling away and it becomes apparent that actually they were never truly there in the first place. So our idea of what the master is, of who the master is, who the teacher is, becomes refined in exactly the same proportion and at the same time that our ideas about what we are become refined. So as the I loses its accretions, so the teacher loses his or her accretions. And those accretions with which we dress the teacher are exactly the same accretions with which we dress ourself, thoughts, images, perceptions, sensations, as we go more and more deeply with the help of our friend to turn towards what we truly are, what we seem to be, and what he or she seems to be, loses their apparent objectness. And there, as a result, there seems to be this merging of the two. And this is very well documented in the traditions, this merging of the teacher and the student. It's not really emerging. It's, it's a recognition that you are always in fact one. 
But and of course, this can be quite shocking, yeah, because maybe you're projecting onto the master that he's kind of a bit higher or specialer than you are, and then suddenly one day you recognize that you're the same as the master. It's, it can be shocking, and it depends on the um, different qualities of the, the style of the particular so-called master. In my case, it wasn't at all shocking because the whole thing <laughs> happened so, so sweetly and just saturated with friendliness. There were no... There was no rejection of my projection. Every time I tried to grab this person, I, I was just grabbing the wind. I mean, there was nothing there. There was no rejection of my attempt to, to make my teacher a person. There was just nothing to get hold of. And I was left hanging. And, and all the energies that went towards this, uh, they just, they collapsed. And, and I learned as a result of this, as it were, to withdraw the projection. It was never, there was no resistance, no denial, no rejection of this, on the part of my teacher, uh, of, of this projection. There was just this understanding that it's natural. It's a natural stage. And that if not played with in any way, and when I say played with, I mean both if it's not rejected or equally common if it's not played with. And then it just simply, it's got nowhere to go. The energies of the mind keep on going in that direction for a certain time. But because they're not giving anything to hold on to, the energies kind of collapse. And the relationship then begins to change from being one of a a student-teacher relationship to being one of friendship. For the teacher, it was always one of friendship. For the, stu for the student, it seemed to be a student-teacher relationship for a short period of time, or for however long it takes in each individual case. But sooner or later, we realize that it's a, re a relationship of, of friendship. It's love. It's called love. And it's very inspiring if one's spent a long period of time with a, with a teacher who, who has this impersonal quality of love. Without knowing it, we learn how to have impersonal friendships. We, le we learn that love is something at the same time most intimate, but at the same time truly impersonal. So to begin with very often this quality of impersonal friendship that you have with your teacher seems to be exclusive to this particular friendship. But after a while, as, as it becomes more, more natural, we, we notice that the same quality of impersonal intimacy is not just given, is not just shared between these apparent two. It begins to pervade all our friendships and it has a profound effect on our relationships, whether those relationships are intimate relationships or relationships with our colleagues. or We, we live this impersonal intimacy, this impersonal quality of love with everyone in whatever way is appropriate. And it transforms friendship. Friendships truly thrive. They, they, they become so sweet, so, so tender. Really, I, I discovered true friendship when I met my teacher. And I don't mean by that that I didn't know what true friendship was. I did. Of course, like everyone, I loved friendship, love. <laughs> But I was, I was, 
as it were, shown the direction. And, and when I say shown, none of this happened through words. It was all just through spending time together that it became more and more obvious and that I noticed it began to... that my other relationships seemed to have this same quality of, of impersonal intimacy. I mean, you mentioned earlier about bhakti, which is devotion. I mean, <clears throat> in a way, what you're describing is, is this bhakti devotional quality, I think. Yes, to begin with, it may seem that it's devotion for a person, for a teacher. But if the teacher is, is um, truly impersonal, then the teacher gives you nothing there's nothing there, objective, for your, for your devotion to hook itself onto. And slowly, and, and, and in some cases, um, as you referred to earlier, it can be a little bit abrasive, but in my case it was very slow and gentle and sweet. The, our love, which seems to be love for a person, is very slowly turned around, reorientated towards the true object of devotion, which is the self. So all devotion is, in the end, only devotion for one thing. And if the, if the, if the teacher doesn't need your devotion for his or her own self-image, Something about the, the relationship, the friendship, enables our devotion to find its true home, to find its true place, which is presence. And you don't even know it's happening. You don't feel that you're being turned around. Or again, in, in, in my case, it's not, there's no violence. It was effortless. I didn't even know it was happening. I just noticed afterwards that it had happened. I looked back and I thought, those old projections, those old ideas about my teacher, that they're just not there. There's just this friendliness, this tenderness. This and the, the, my devotion has found its home, found that for which it was always longing. But it was never in the direction of a, an object or a person. It, was, it turned in on itself. It found its own heart, as it were. <clears throat> very poetic, actually. It's very beautiful how you describe these things. This is a, this is a rather strange question now to, to more or less finish. Um, seekers often have curious ideas about the enlightened state. Please describe your typical day and how you perceive the world. <laughs> In my typical day, um, I won't go into too much detail, but I'll just give you a, a, <laughs> a broad sketch. I, I, Wake up in the morning. And <laughs> my English conditioning is is still uh, very prevalent, so I can't do anything without a cup of tea. And of course, it has to be lapsang. So I, I make a cup of tea, and and um, if there's time, go back to bed and sit in bed chatting with my wife, Ellen. Or we sit by the window and look out of the window. But sometimes there isn't time for that, so when I get up, still make a cup of tea and get on with whatever business the day has in hand. I won't go into too much different <laughs> detail, but it's, it's a balance, as we were talking earlier, between um, my work as an artist in my studio and um, answering a great deal of correspondence from people who have read my book or... And so these, these two aspects of, of my life, and, um, which are really two different aspects of the same thing, involve a, 
activity, thinking, doing, making, organizing, speaking, relating, telephone, emails, and 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 I enjoy, and and I, I should say also, um, I have a child, a ten-year-old boy. Um, he doesn't live with me, so I don't look after him on a daily basis, but I'm very closely connected with him and spend a lot of time with him and he with us. So it's a very, let's put it like this, it's a very full-blown, fully, <laughs> very expansive, very full life in the world of um, relationship, um, work, um, interaction with all kinds of people and objects and and it's it's I find it all very enjoyable. It's it's a, in in all these different ways I, I I find love and beauty and intelligence is is expressed and expressed in uniquely in each way with my son in one way, with my wife in another way, with my assistant in my studio in another way. But it's all, it, it's writing in a particular way, making another way. But it, it comes, it comes from the same, the same place. It's, um, It's like, a, it's like a sort of outpouring. Uh, and I can't remember the second part of the question. Well, I think that's, that's okay. I mean, if you wanted to say something about how you perceive the world. I perceive the world. I, I experience that That what I am takes the shape of thinking, it takes the shape of imagining, it takes the shape of sensing, and it takes the shape of perceiving. So I feel that it's myself, and by myself I mean this knowing presence, that takes the shape of perceiving, for instance, this perception that it is made out of that which knows it, that it is made out of myself. So I perceive the world that I take the shape of the, the taste, the delicious taste of Lapsang tea <laughs> in the morning. And then I take the, the shape of this nice conversation that I have with Ellen. And I take the shape of the light coming in through the window. And I take the shape of the sound of the telephone as it goes. I take the shape of the email that comes in. I take the shape of the subsequent thought. It's, it's this presence taking the shape of thinking, imagining, sensing, and perceiving of, as, as like a kind of flow, always being itself, always remaining itself. but always taking the shape of, of new forms. Always the same as itself, but always different as the shape of thinking, imagining, sensing and perceiving that it, that it takes. You've given us a profound discourse on awakening. I would add very poetically when you would meet someone with a passion for awakening, what would your short advice be? When I, people that come to my meetings, and when I, when I, I feel this passion, it, it, every time, without exception, it completely melts my heart. That, that's all I can say. I, I don't have any I don't have any s standard response to give them because it depends where their where their particular question comes from. So, 
I, 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 I feel their love, their passion, their interest, their devotion. And so I listen, very, but I listen with my whole body, not just with my mind, but I listen my, with my whole body to, to them. I, I, I take them in, I, I take them into myself. I feel like I'm them, I know where they are. I know and I feel, I, I go to where their question comes from. I go there with them. And then from there, we go together, we hold hands and, and we, we walk. So it depends, it depends completely where they're coming from. Of course, deeply they're coming for this love of truth, this love of love, of intelligence, and I share that with them. But then this love is, is tailored uniquely and specifically to each case, and there's absolutely no sense of what that's going to be beforehand. It's, it's, it's this, just this deep listening. And that's as much as I can say. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It was it was very interesting for me because um, I think you have a very um, Oh, I don't know how to explain it, but it's anyway poetic or creative even maybe the right word, way to express a lot of things. It's, it's very um, unusual, I think. So it's very interesting when you have this history of many years of pottery making. And I don't know, it, it, yeah, something very, very lovely, very lovely. Yes. I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't even realize it at the time, but what I was doing, what I was exploring in my work as an artist was, it was an aspect of self-inquiry. Right. It was, in the, uh, it was exploring the nature of experience. Right. It was only later that I came to, to realize that, to formulate it. And I was brought up in the kind of classical Advaita school where it was all the path of Jnana and the path of Bhakti. And my, my love of perceiving, my love of art, my love of beauty, I always felt a little bit apologetic about it in the traditional advice, and it wasn't until I met my teacher that yeah. my love of, I realized that my love of truth and my love of beauty yeah. were the same thing, and that for me was, I mean, that was an explosion. Yeah. It, it just liberated my, 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 my love of beauty. Right. Right. And I realized, yes, that, that's what it was about all along. It, it was kind of brought in line with my deep love of truth. Yeah. I realized it was the same thing, and that expressing it, that making things, was exactly the same as one would express love with a friend or that one would express intelligence through, through words or writing. That was so exciting for me to realize that. Right. No, I can understand that completely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not much, I don't know if it's right to say not much recognized, but I think um, Francis is sort of unique, a bit unique about that. I think Francis is is very unusual uh, um, in that respect, and and his teacher Jean Klein was an artist. Oh, was he? A, 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 a very good musician, an artist, and had this deep sensitivity, not just for per perceiving. Particularly, he loved painting and, and music, but he had this deep sensitivity towards the body. So he'd explored the body, not just the sense of separation at the level of the mind. He'd explored the sense of me at the level of feelings. What is it that makes me feel that I am separate? Mm -hmm. What is it that makes me feel that this is me and that, not, that this is not me? So mm -hmm. um, both Francis and Jean Klein had this very, this deep love of, of beauty and, and their teaching is... is um, equally given to the realm of the body and, and the world, not just the realm of the, 
of the mind. And in that respect, I think I agree with you. I, mm. I was, uh, you know, I, I was blown away when I met him. Yeah, because and it's a very nice addition to traditional Advaita, I think, because additional Advaita, or anyway, the way it apparently has been taught, was a bit dry. It's a bit um, yes, dry. I guess is I the right think word. there's a certain stage where, in the early stages of self-inquiry, where where we're discovering that what we are is not a body or a mind, where we have, as it were, to put the world put the body and the mind and the world at a bit of a distance. We say, no, I am not this, I am not this, I am not this. Mm -hmm. We come to the understanding, I am nothing, that is, I am nothing objective. And this is the traditional position of the witness. Mm -hmm. But then we, we have to go on right. from that and discover that, I'm, yes, I'm nothing objective, but this presence that I am is also the substance of everything, so I'm not just nothing, I'm also everything. And I think some schools, some traditional schools got, as it were, stuck mm -hmm. at the witness stage. And they kept the body, the mind, and the world at bay, right. as, as, this, as this rather dangerous abode, right. this dangerous realm that, that obscures consciousness, mm -hmm. and therefore it's a bit dangerous. And I grew up with that. I grew up with 20 years of that. The world, mm. don't get lost in the world. It's dangerous. Right. It's, it'll, it, it veils consciousness. It's, a, and there was a, it's slightly true also it, in this early it's stage it's yeah, when you're really... Absolutely. It's a net for many of us, and for me it was absolutely necessary. It, I was able to put all that at bay and give attention to presence. And, and that's, that's so important because it establishes the presence of consciousness and the primacy of consciousness. But mm. if we stay there, and I stayed here for a long time, we remain in this slightly aloof mm. position of, of the witness just behind experience, slightly removed from experience. The world was kept at, at bay, and it wasn't until I met Francis that, these, that, that the exploration continued Mm. more deeply into my experience and that the two came back together again. But what then became clear is that this I doesn't just pervade this body as it had seemed to previously. It pervades the world as well. Mm. I, I, I'm interested in your response to the film we've just made about Ramana Maharshi. You probably know about him. Uh, yes. And he's kind of an icon of somebody who sits on a couch and doesn't speak and in a way doesn't do anything. And in this film, we've tried to give him a more rounded uh, image. Because actually, it's not true. That image is not true about him at all. He, for 15 years, he was the cook for the ashram. And for 20 years, he was the architect and builder, designer of the, of the ashram. You see, so he's constantly doing stuff, actually. That this is one of the reasons why it's so valuable to have a friend, mm. to have a teacher, mm. and to spend time, not just sitting in satsang asking questions. Right, because that's, that's one aspect that's, that's of it. That's the preliminary. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just the... Right. The, but, but spending time together, because, because you see this love and in this intelligence in action, in response to every, all the minute details of life. It doesn't mean to say that you want to respond like that. Not at all. No. At the level of the body-mind, you're a totally different body-mind. Sure, sure. But nevertheless, you, you, just through being around, through hanging around, you, you see how this love and intelligence is tailored minutely to every single situation and just by being in that environ you learn your own ways that are unique to your own body mind of expressing the same love and understanding in relation to the unique situations <coughs> that you're going to find yourself in and i had i had 25 years of classical advaita vedanta i mean i had ideas up to here about 
what I thought. Mm -hmm. You know, for 20 years my teacher had had an orange robe and a beard and, and, and I had so many ideas and I, was, I tried to fit mm -hmm. myself and it, of course it didn't work. There was some sense of a mismatch. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I, after, you know, that I spent many years who was close that, who was that teacher with Shantananda your... Saraswati, the, the Shankacharya of the north of India. Oh, okay. So it was a very classical advi Advaita mm -hmm. teaching, and please don't misunderstand me, I loved it. It's a beautiful teaching. I loved mm -hmm. it, but there was a limit for me. Right. It was, right. it was, there was something missing, which was that more, it was the more the tantric approach, where absolutely everything was included. Um, so I think it's, yes, all kinds of ideas were projected onto Ramana Maharshi, but only those who truly lived with him knew what he was like and, and, and saw him cooking and looking after his animals. Yeah, and, and getting and angry and papers. screaming at people and, and yes, doing all kind of stuff yes, that spiritual yes, people don't do. Yes, you see. yes. And it's it, very, um, very important, I think. Yeah. It, it's... It's why it's, a, it's a, a beautiful thing and a valuable thing to have a friend, to be with someone who is established in this love and understanding. And just by being together, you, you catch it like we catch flu from each other. You don't know where it, when it happened, where it happened, why it happened, how it happened, and you don't mind. The important thing is to, to, catch, <laughs> to catch what he or she has. Sure. Uh, yeah. Nice. Mm. Yeah, well, I was interested when you said lap song because I used to really like that tea. And one day in our community, I told people I really like Earl Grey. And I just realized now I've been drinking Earl Grave now for three or four years and I never have a lap song. <laughs> I really used to like it. <laughs> you please make a note about well, that. Come, come and visit me in England. <laughs> very, very nice cup of that lap song in a very nice cup and saucer. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay. you're dropping the tiredness. We should have something to do. Well, I'm, I'm not so long tired long. now. It, you know, mm. it came and went a bit. Yeah. You know. yeah. But probably some food would be good. You still filming? Or are you asleep? <laughs> no, I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Delicious. Thank you.